Hello, good morning. Um, I am Benoit, a uh, consultant at Verhaard in our uh, Open Innovation Lab. Hi, I am Ornella and I am a product designer working in the design lab of Verhaard too. Together we're going to tell you this morning something about systemic design and innovation. A uh, marriage of systems thinking and design thinking, uh, which we practice here uh, a lot at uh, Verhaard. In the presentation we're about to bring you, we're going to first talk about the rising complexity in the systems around us today. And then also we're going to continue uh, explaining what the problems look like we see in those systems. Typically they are complex and even wicked. In third place we are going to introduce to you also how we can start to tackle these uh, types of problems and fourth we're also going to shed some light in how you can get started in your organization uh, with these practices. Now first before we head off into this story I want to um, start with a short definition of um, the There's a problem here with the pointer and the slides. Uh, but first of all, I want to start with a short definition of what a system is. And we are going to see some examples in a bit. Um, but in general, we consider a system as a whole of interconnected things and elements. And those elements all work together to perform a unique uh, emergent function uh, for that system. So in, in short, we, we, we can summarize a system as uh, a number of nodes and links um, that each one influence uh, one another uh, within the system's boundary. Uh, now, the, the small example here on the slide um, is just a um, very simple system. Uh, and most drawings and representations we will make of these systems will be quite limited uh, given also the complexity of most systems today, uh, which makes also that you can view them from a, a number of different perspectives, from a structural perspective or interactive perspective. Now, without further ado, uh, let's look at some uh, systems around us uh, today. And what we'll see is that the complexity in these systems is rising a lot. One of these systems that I like to talk about a lot is the electric power grids that uh, deliver us uh, electricity uh, for all our devices uh, and our light bulbs uh, throughout the day. And while these systems were quite simple uh, in the early days, uh, delivering power from a power plant to households, putting out a kettle at night. Uh, today, we see a lot of new ways of creating or producing power. And uh, solar panels and, and, and windmills are some of the examples. Um, and these types of small power plants don't just generate a steady source of power. They are influenced by the weather and are influenced also um, by, by price setting in how much power they deliver. And not only on the production side, these power grids uh, influence a lot of changes. Also on the consumption side, we see now much more electric vehicles uh, taking lots of electricity uh, at moments where no one before uh, consumed that much electricity. And not the cars only, there's a lot of new mobility options that are electric powered that consume um, electricity throughout the day uh, at what at first seems quite irregular moments uh, considering the previously static nature of those power grids. And it's not just mobility, it's also the electricity we consume in our houses that are controlled by smart algorithms which we don't even control ourselves. It's just an algorithm that says I want to uh, source power now uh, or I want to switch it off now. Also in factories, you have the same principle applying. We see also similar uh, evolutions in the urban areas around us where um, there's many more people in these urban areas than a few decades ago who live there, who work there. 
and who go to travel there. And not only physically, people are also socially connected to these cities much more than before via digital means. And it's not just the, the social fabric of urban areas that's changing rapidly, it's also the built environment that's expanding and not only expanding outwards, but also upwards. Um, also much more connections um, than before with public transport, for example. And while you see the sort of social fabric and the, the physical fabric of cities changing, you see also that the actors within those uh, systems, the human beings, uh, uh, for starters, also change roles. Many more people uh, take higher education, for example, and, and this is typically concentrated in these urban areas. Also, much more people take on jobs that didn't exist before, uh, that create new connections in those systems. Another great example of a system that's becoming more complex over the years are our global supply chains. And our global supply chains are influenced also by uh, our behavior as consumers. Uh, we, we buy stuff when we need it and we buy it online and then it needs to be brought from us, starting from the raw materials that need to be sourced all around the world and the production factories associated with it, especially for uh, things like uh, processor chips. We are dependent on a very intricate and complex supply chain there, which goes uh, all the way from the raw materials through ports and distribution centers until in the end somebody delivers a package to us at the place where we uh, want it to be delivered. So throughout these examples, the electric power grids, the urban areas and these global supply chains, we see that the complexity in the systems around us has increased a lot over the last decades and it continues to rise. Um, it's noted particularly in the number of people and organizations involved in these systems, also in the diversity of actors that are active in these systems these days, also the uh, non, not straightforward types of relationships they have. We call them non-linear relations. Um, and and in, in general, we see a much more dynamic structure and a lot more information uh, going through these systems. Now, all these evolutions make that we experience as human beings, but also as businesses and organizations, much more complexity. True. And um, a complex system and a complex um, uh, network of, of relationships, uh, it, brings, uh, it brings us to uh, complex uh, problems, actually, because when uh, there is many actors involved, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty also, and the chances are higher that there might be any issues emerging in a very cumbersome system that is very difficult to uh, change. Um, this is what we are going to talk about uh, forward, how innovation can take place in these complex systems that keep growing in complexity. Um, we, call, we call wicked problems uh, these issues that may um, uh, be created in these complex systems because the causes and the effects of uh, the problems are non-linear. That means that they are interconnected in not a straightforward way, but um, in circular ways. Uh, they, for example, uh, in the electricity uh, power grid network, um, the the connection between um, a producer and a, a producer of electricity and a consumer could be the same. One could be the other. Um, the effect uh, of of uh, a cause could be related to each other. Um, we already told there could be so many stakeholders. Uh, we also told that um, one wicked problem does not have one definite answer. So uh, there is no solution uh, when there is a problem. There are many solutions. And um, let's uh, talk about some uh, examples. Um, I'm sure you have heard about the plastic soup. It's not, uh, for example, because 
we uh, throw plastic in the sea, that uh, the plastic soup uh, is, is a problem. It's not because um, yeah, people are polluting the sea directly. Uh, for example, uh, rising obesity is a problem. It's not because people are eating more that uh, obesity is a problem. Uh, financial crisis, uh, income disparity, climate change, they are all wicked problems that are difficult to solve and there is no one solution to it. Now, um, the reason why it is important to uh, have the right approach uh, towards uh, systemic uh, problems and, and wicked problems is because uh, wanting to fix the problem with a too simple solution could actually uh, have the adverse effect. Um, we call these unintended consequence consequences. And um, a very uh, known um, a uh, case is uh, the cobra effect. In the cobra effect, uh, there is actually a little story to it. Um, there was uh, once... Uh, a city where there was a problem with cobras and they had too many cobras and they were biting people. So what did they do? Uh, they were offering uh, one euro, for example, for everyone that could bring one dead cobra to the king. And after a while, people, of course, started to abuse uh, this, this uh, uh, um, rule and they were actually um, making more cobras and they were having, their, having them at home. In the end, when the king was suspicious about all the euros he was giving out, um, he, he stopped giving it uh, the incentive. And in the end, everyone released the cobras they were having at home. And in the end, there were more cobras than at, be at the beginning. So it got the inverse effect. Um, other examples, real life examples of cobra effects uh, happened here in, in Belgium, for example. They started a littering campaign because there was too much I illegal litter, littering. And uh, in the end, um, it, it came out as people were littering even more. Uh, same as uh, with carbon uh, points, um, they were giving at um, uh, industry level and uh, people were abusing it to its called uh, perverse incentive. Um, now, the innovations um, that are systemic are a bit different than normal innovations. Why? Because uh, the uh, problem is not solved only by the um, products that are new or services that are new. Um, so the, the interventions are not only the physical or the new innovations. It's also in the partnerships and in the relationships um, that are new. Take, for example, the uh, story of the seven blind men looking at one elephant or not looking at one elephant, feeling at one elephant, and they all um, see the problem at a different perspective. So one blind man might uh, feel the uh, ears of the elephant and think that's a carpet, and the other one might rub the belly and think that it's a wall. Um, but they should work together to understand the, the problem together. Um, and it's not uh, the new technologies uh, that is going to help them understand it. It's uh, working together uh, along with the new technologies that is going to solve the problem. Um, to approach these uh, systemic uh, innovations, we have some frameworks, as Benoit already told in the beginning. It's the marriage between system thinking and design thinking. So systems thinking is more of a holistic approach. It's about understanding the system. It's about looking at the whole. And design thinking is problem solving. So what we're going to do, and I'm going to go over it in very top level, is define the problem. What are we going to change? Then we're going to understand the problem. We're going to map all the stakeholders. We're going to map all the relationships between them. Are they reinforcing each other? Are there things that are weakening each other? Then we are going to visualize what the desired outcome is for the future of all stakeholders. So we're going to look what everyone uh, is wanting out of this situation and what the desired outcome is. Then uh, the levers are going to be identified where in the system is the best 
gate um, to to work further on. Uh, so there might be some access points that are going to really change, make uh, make change uh, more easily. And then we're going to intervene uh, by thinking in solutions. And the end, um, just as I said before, it's not only the innovations that are going to make change, it's also um, fostering the transition and keeping an eye on uh, the partnerships, the, the new relations, and um, really having this change management on point. Um, just for a, a, a last example, I'm going to show some tools that we used to do this here at Verhaart. Um, some mapping tools, uh, we've got them online or offline. Uh, as you see here on the top um, of the images, you see some mapping tools made with Kumu. It's a nice website where you can really um, visualize these relationships between partners, uh, for example or um, the weakening or the strengthening connections between elements in a system. Um, we also have a lot of canvas where we can uh, ideate and uh, work on a topic together with different stakeholders. For example, everyone knows the business model canvas. Um, we have some custom tools also. Uh, if some uh, of the partners uh, really wishes to know what the return of investment is for them in this project. Uh, this can be calculated using new software, for example, and also the soft skills, um, looking at the big picture, this uh, systemic thinking, design thinking, and some researching techniques, visualization, etc. I'm giving back the word to Benoit to help you know what you have to do in your organizations to start with it. All right. For um, applying now these, um, fr this framework and these tools to solve some of the complex problems in your organization, an important first step is, of course, to start identifying some of the complex problems that your organization has to deal with. And this, this first step is really looking outwards from your organization to the networks and the ecosystems that you are a part of and seeing which are the hurdles that will prevent you from further growth or maybe which are the disruptive evolutions that are going through these, these systems and networks that your organization is part of. Um, and this is really a, a, a first step because w without a complex problem to tackle, it's of course not necessary to bring out the big guns to um, uh, help with it. Um, a second important um, step that you as an organization should be making is to think beyond introducing new products and services. Of course, as a value generating organization, it's important that you also introduce uh, products and services that are of value to your customers or other stakeholders. Uh, but when you're going to tackle these complex problems, it's also uh, important to realize what the impact is on the system. Remember what Ornella talked about uh, with the Cobra effect. Uh, sometimes a overly simplistic solution is not the answer to a uh, complex problem. And then the question is how to make it sustainable over time. Sustainable, of course, for your organization. Um, it has to have a sustainable business model, um, otherwise uh, it won't last. But also in the system, it has to make a uh, change that sticks. Think, for example, about the face masks that we are wearing a lot over the last year and a half. Uh, you see that from the moment that the government says that the face mask is not necessary again, people drop it. It's not the type of innovation that will stick. It's not the type of innovation that will prevent us from the next, um, the next pandemic. And this is an important realization to make. It's not just about producing a product or a service for people that helps them in the instant. It's about making something that also affects change in the system. Important as well, as, as Arnaud talked about, these complex problems involve a lot of stakeholders. And uh, more as with the, um, let's say, internal innovation practices of your organization, um, systemic innovation requires you to build multi-stakeholder trust and collaboration. And that's really working together, not just with 
other teams inside your organization, but also working together with external organizations, with other uh, actors from your ecosystem. And uh, this unfolds in two ways. And this is first, you need to have a mandate for change um, that is not just from your own organization, but it also involves key players in your ecosystem. And with that mandate for change, it's also important that these actors are going to do a coordinated action. As Ornella explained, uh, the systemic innovations require interventions in multiple parts and relations in the system. It's pulling multiple levers at the same time. And this is also really what needs to happen. Of course, aside from this, it's also important to have a uh, team of people who can pull this off. And of course, it starts with a uh, single uh, team and then it fans out to, to other teams in the organization. But it's important to have uh, some people on board who can combine the systemic approach, the holistic thinking uh, and the uh, user-centric problem-solving approach that design thinking offers us. And it's combining both of these uh, together uh, in a team that will allow uh, your organization to go forward with this. Important is that it's not just the mindset, it's also about some of the skills um, that you need in, in mapping systems, in listening to uh, these the systems and in envisioning future scenarios, for example, uh, for these systems. Lastly, it's important uh, to also use uh, systemic design uh, framework and tools, which we introduced shortly to you uh, in this presentation. You can do this on a project level, but you can also lift it up and use it on a more organizational level. Now, one example where we combine this, uh, all, all these uh, elements is in a, um, an engagement where we were asked to introduce circularity in a uh, polyterrain manufacturer's value chain. And the issue there was that, you know, while the manufacturer could recycle chemically some of the uh, compounds, um, that's only a small volume and it's also very inefficient. Um, so most of the, um, let's say, gains that were to made in sustainability uh, lied outside of that organization. And in the value network of that uh, manufacturer, making it a, a wicked problem because there's so many actors involved that you can't just list them on a sheet of paper. Um, nevertheless, um, in, in, in this type of project, we started with mapping what the end-to-end -end product types were that could be refurnished, could be furniture, bedding, isolation, etc. And also looking, of course, at who are the actors behind that and, and, and between uh, that. Uh, as a second step, we went looking into involving and, and, and mapping all these stakeholders um, with these specific uh, product types. Um, it's also important to understand some of the dynamics behind the system. And one of the dynamics we want to understand were the technological evolutions that played out and uh, which, which of these stakeholders could benefit from some of these technical evolutions and which uh, could not do that. Uh, and we did it, for example, uh, with a patent search. In a fourth step, and it's important to engage the stakeholders for this, was sketching the future. And we were uh, looking there to uh, what is important for each of these different stakeholders. It is provided added value to their customers. Is it uh, making a minimum profit on the recycled materials? Or is it just avoiding an extra workload uh, for them? After having sort of mapped out the system, looked at the future scenarios, uh, we went into finding the levers in that system. Which changes could have the biggest gain in circularity um, from that uh, polyuterrain material? And as it turns out, it was recycling car parts and mattresses. Uh, those are two uh, products where there is a, uh, quite a volume of polyterrain and where there is also a road for uh, circularity for these products and where there can also be a business case that is supported by the stakeholders and the rest of the ecosystem. Now, 
as you know, a conclusion of this, uh, this exercise, it was of course also necessary to design business models and roadmaps and uh, logistics to make this work. And in the end, it was also about fostering change uh, with the right KPIs and uh, following these KPIs up together with the partners in the ecosystem. So this is an example of how we took the systemic design uh, framework and how we applied it to a uh, specific case for one of our customers. So um, this marks the end of our presentation about systemic innovation where we took you through uh, what some of the uh, systems are today and what the uh, rising complexity means, uh, what complex problems uh, are and, and how we can tackle them in a project. Um, Ornella and I are now also ready to uh, take some of your questions. Yeah. So I see one question. <clears throat> As complex problems enter companies, their day-to-day -day operations, what can one do from organizational perspective? Do you feel ready? From an organizational perspective, well, um, the, the thing is that um, what one thing should be uh, clear is that, of course, these complex problems, you, you don't sort of expect them uh, typically to happen. Uh, they are there, uh, they are there in the ecosystem. And as an organization, it's important that your people are uh, aware of this and are aware on how to detect these complex problems and have some of the skills on how to deal with them. So um, in, in a first uh, step, let's say, to get started with this, I think it's important that the people have a, a notion of what complexity is, um, how to spot complex problems, and have an idea on what could be the, uh, the, the way forward with this. And it's, it's a part of educating, really, mm -hmm. uh, the people in the organization. And also, it needs to be, people need to be aware in the, future, in the near future that uh, problems are going to be more and more complex. So uh, also as an answer for the other question, what needs to change? Maybe we have to innovate in the frameworks that we use today to tackle innovation. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. <laughs> I see that our time for questions has passed now. Um, okay. All right. Well, uh, it was uh, nice talking to you about uh, complex systems. If you have more questions, you can always reach out to uh, Ornella or to me, and we'd be happy to tell you more about it.